Hi there, guys and girls. Welcome to the Evolution Lecture video number two. Um, let's begin where we left off. So last time we were showing you how to do some half-life uh, calculations. Now we're going to talk about um, some more history of, of life on our planet. So let's talk about the first organic compounds on our planet. So let's, everyone always wonders how did life begin? What were the first cells? How did the first cells form? We don't know exactly why. But a few people um, came up with some ideas and some hypotheses as to how organic molecules could form on our planet. Why organic molecules? Well, organic molecules are the molecules of life, all right? They're the molecules of life. So therefore, before you have cells and before you have life, you need to have organic molecules. You can't have life without organic molecules, okay? So O'Paren and Haldane, the gentleman down here, they came up with a hypothesis. They said early Earth, all right, early Earth was not a habitable place to humans. We could not have lived on early Earth. It was toxic. It was poisonous. There wasn't any oxygen on the early Earth. Photosynthesis is how oxygen is made, and photosynthesis wasn't around yet. It had not evolved yet. So photosynthetic organisms are not present. So Earth's early atmosphere had a chemical in the air called ammonia. We use it to disinfect and kill things, all right? would be toxic to us. Hydrogen gas, water, and um, hydrocarbons such as methane. Probably carbon dioxide too, probably carbon monoxide too, but not quite yet. Maybe not in Earth's very, very early atmosphere. Probably showed up later when organs showed up, but apparently they did not believe that it was quite there yet. All right, but some people do believe that CO2 was part of Earth's early atmosphere. So we're going to go with those four, ammonia, hydrogen, water, and methane, hydrocarbons. They believe that if you take all these things, you could reassemble their elements in certain ways and produce organic molecules. Remember, organic molecules, you need carbons, you need hydrogens, you need oxygens, and nitrogens would help if you want to build proteins. All right, So they have everything there to build a lot of the building blocks of, of organic molecules. They believe that um, life originated in the sea, in the oceans. They believe that organic molecules basically um, appeared in the oceans. Okay, and we're going to explain to you kind of in a second how these organic molecules could have appeared. Um, they believe that lightning, UV light, the radiation, the energy that comes from these was able to disconnect these elements from each other and reassemble them forming organic molecules. That's what these guys believe. So they gave the idea of how the first building blocks of life could have shown up. Not necessarily how life showed up, but how the building blocks. So you need the building blocks first in order to start building bigger macro molecules. All right. So first you have amino acids, nucleotides, then you can build proteins and DNA. Then you can begin the beginning of a cell called a protocell, which maybe over time becomes a cell. So it's not easy to pick and figure out how the first cells and the first living things showed up on our planet. But these guys said, hey, here's an idea of how, how the building blocks could have showed up potentially. Now, in order to build these bigger molecules like proteins and DNA, a dehydration synthesis reaction has to take place. And that's a reaction we learned in the earlier quarter, earlier part of the year. And that's a building up reaction that takes the monomers and builds the polymers. Amino acids are the monomer, protein is the polymer. Nucleotides are the monomers. DNA is a polymer, all right? So you first got to start small, then you get bigger, then you get bigger, then you get bigger, and hopefully life showed up. That's the belief that it that happened, all right? So somebody decided to test this. Stanley Miller and Harry Urey, here's a picture of Mr. Miller. What they did is they said, let's take O'Paren and Haldane's hypothesis, and let's test it. Let's build a device, and in this device, we're going to have the ocean, water, and we're going to heat it up. All right, we're going to heat up the ocean because at the bottom of the ocean, you have hydrothermal vents. They can heat up areas of the ocean. That can happen. So it, this creates water vapor. So there's one of the gases that's in the air. They added methane, CH4. They added ammonia, NH3, and they added hydrogen gas, H2. And those are gases. So those would be part of the air or the atmosphere that is found on the Earth. They use an electric circuit and electrode to simulate lightning. They could have shined light on it, ultraviolet lamps too. They did all kinds of things. So they tried to simulate what happened on early Earth with the, the elements and the compounds, excuse me, that were present on early Earth. 
what did they discover? Well, they let this thing go and they had a collection chamber that collected the fluid, the liquid that condensed and became when this with this this water vapor and all these chemicals condensed and a reaction took place. They collected the water and they found amino acids. Go figure. They found the building blocks of protein. They, they occurred spontaneously. Their reaction happened. They added the electricity. They added the water vapor, the ammonia, the, the hydrogen gas and everything. And then boom, they end up with amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So they tested the hypothesis and it came out pretty solid that the building blocks of life can appear spontaneously on their own. So other scientists have done a whole bunch of these types of tests and used different things, and they've produced a whole bunch of things. ATP, nucleotides, which are the building blocks of DNA, ATP, which is energy. So apparently, organic stuff can appear spontaneously if we have the right environment. And early Earth, based on their studies, had the right environment to produce some of those building blocks. Some people believe there's a hypothesis, your book didn't mention it, but I believe it's called the seeds from space hypothesis. Some people believe that the first cells to appear on earth showed up here on a meteorite. They crashed into the earth and that rock matter that showed up here um, brought, brought living things with it um, in those rocks. All right. Some people believe that it's called the seeds from space hypothesis is what it's called. The first cells on our planet, um, what did we believe them to be? Well, the first cells on our planet, number one, they were more simple cells. So they were more like prokaryotes, bacteria, than they are like eukaryotes. Early Earth had no oxygen. Their oxygen hadn't formed until photosynthesis. Photosynthesis did not happen first. So early Earth was anaerobic, no oxygen environment. Anaerobic, no oxygen. First organisms were probably heterotrophs. Because to be an autotroph, you have to do photosynthesis, and that's more complex. So complex things don't always show up first. They, they usually will show up later. So heterotrophs meaning that the first organisms were like bacteria, bacteria-like prokaryotes, that needed to find their, a food source. They needed food. They were heterotrophs. They couldn't make their own food, and they hated oxygen. Oxygen was poison to them. They would have probably died. They would have died in the presence of oxygen. Oxidation would have took place and killed them, basically. So the first cells, anaerobes, no oxygen need to find food, heterotrophs, and bacteria like prokaryotes. So this next statement is kind of confusing. You can read it, but I'll explain it to you. What it says is that if this population of bacteria, these heterotrophs started to grow, they would run out of food pretty quickly because their food had to form spontaneously the way I just explained it to you uh, regarding the, the hypothesis that Stanley Miller tested. So eventually they'd run out of food if their population got big. They just wouldn't have enough food forming spontaneously to feed them at all times. So what this is telling you is that over time, autotrophs or things that did photosynthesis were more favored. They just weren't here yet. But when those things did show up, they, it was easier for them to survive. And why? Because they didn't have to go out and find their food. They were able to make their own food just using air, CO2 from the air, and water from their environment. They were able to produce their own food. So it's a complicated statement. This comes from your book. What it means is that it, it meant that being an autotroph was more beneficial for survival, but that didn't happen first. That happened later. This right here shows you a fossil that was found in um, a Western Australia, um, and they dated it back to a bacteria fossil to 3.4 billion years old. So they're saying life has been around for a while. Earth is about 4.5 billion. Life showed up in the 3 point something billion years is what we believe. And it, this changes all the time when they find new rocks or new fossils that contain these fossils. They might find rocks that contain these bacteria fossils and then they date them and they realize how old things are. Chemosynthesis. Um, so archaea, let's talk about archaea. Um, these are organisms that live in very harsh environment. It is believed that the first organisms on our planet were archaea, the, that type of prokaryote. You bacteria make up the other type of bacteria. You bacteria is the kind that we're used to. E. coli, the ones that make us sick. Salmonella, the one that makes us sick. Staph infection. The ones that make us sick are you bacteria. Those were not believed to be the first prokaryotes. The first prokaryotes were from this archaea or archaic group. They're old. 
archaea, like archaic, very old. Um, they lived in much harsher conditions. They still to this day live and can and thrive in harsh environments. They they are probably the first organisms on our planet. Earth was very harsh at first. It was not a favorable, nice environment. So since it was such a harsh environment, archaea were probably the original organisms on our planet. How do they, uh, the archaea that live on the bottom of the ocean, for example, how did they get their food? They got it through this process called chemosynthesis. They produced food, sugars and food, by synthesizing chemicals, turning chemical, using the energy from the chemo, the chemicals, in order to synthesize or make the food that they need. The, the chemicals that they use for energy are hydrogen sulfides. It comes out of the the vents in the bottom of the ocean, hydrogen sulfide comes out, and these particular prokaryotes can turn that with the help of carbon dioxide and water, and they can turn it into sugars and food for, for the organisms down at the bottom of the ocean. And that process, like I said, chemosynthesis is how they produce their food. Similar to regular bacteria, prokaryotes are used to, very similar, but structurally different. They, they are a separate group of organisms. Photosynthesis. Well, when did photosynthesis show up? Well, we got to go by fossils, and this is what pictures of, of cyanobacteria fossils look like. I'll explain that to you in a second. This is cyanobacteria, green bacteria, and they believe these are... These are the original photosynthetic bacteria on our planet, or descendants of the original photosynthetic prokaryotes on our planet. Um, they call them cyanobacteria because they are the green bacteria that do photosynthesis. They produce oxygen for us on our planet, lots of it actually. Um, what do we have here? This is called a stromatolite. So layers of these guys colonized this rock area, okay, these, these bacteria, these cyanobacteria, and then they became fossilized. They can date these fossils and these rocks back, and then they, whoops, and then they can give you an idea of how long they've been around. Um, I believe the earliest ones are about 3.5 million years old, these fossils, stromatolite fossils that they have found. Like I said, these stromatolites are very similar to modern day cyanobacteria. And that's cyanobacteria right there. Um, they believed it took, I don't know, about, it took a long time to get the earth to the amount of oxygen levels that we have today. At first, there was some photosynthetic organisms, these bacteria doing photosynthesis, producing oxygen. But it took, they believe, billions of years to get to a point where it was habitable to, to humans or other organisms that require oxygen. Um, what happened to the Earth that started to help make it um, better and more livable for humans? Oxygen gas was being formed by the stromatolites, excuse me, by the cyanobacteria and the stromatolites from the day, and that oxygen, some of it was getting broken down um, by ultraviolet radiation, and it was getting turned into ozone, O3. Well, ozone is the Earth's sunscreen. So living things couldn't survive until ozone was around. A lot of living things would die due to the radiation of the ultraviolet radiation of the sun. So photosynthesis showed up, oxygen showed up then. After oxygen showed up, then oxygen started getting turned into ozone, and after ozone started forming, that became like a blanket around the Earth, protecting the Earth from the excessive ultraviolet light, and then organisms were able to start living and thriving in, uh, in, in the Earth's environments because of the protection it was getting from the ozone. The first eukaryotes, well now remember, these are, these are cells that are more complex. This is you and me. Um, the first eukaryotes that showed up, they showed up well after prokaryotes. Prokaryotes were here for a while before eukaryotes showed up. Um, what are characteristics of eukaryotes? Well, they're bigger than bacteria. Um, they have DNA that has chromosomes in the nucleus. Prokaryotes have one chromosome and they don't have a nucleus. Um, eukaryotes have like a skeleton, a cytoskeleton that controls all these different things inside of it. They have membrane bound parts on the inside. Remember, there's no, there's a membrane around a prokaryote, but there's no membrane bound parts inside of it or organelles inside of it. They, it is believed, and this will probably take you back to the earlier quarter, um, earlier part of the year, it is believed that eukaryotes descended from prokaryotes. All right, and let's talk about that. That was this concept called endosymbiosis. So this is repeated from an earlier part of the year. What does endosymbiosis tell us? Um, they believe that older eukaryotes, how did they become eukaryotes? Well, they engulfed or swallowed up smaller prokaryotes. And those prokaryotes started living inside of them and having a job 
basically. So let's showing you here um, when it engulfed aerobic heterotrophic prokaryotes, those things became what's called mitochondria. Why aerobic? They needed oxygen, and our mitochondria use oxygen to produce energy. Okay, when they engulfed photosynthetic prokaryotes like cyanobacteria, those became chloroplasts and, and part of the plastid grouping of organisms. So if they engulfed a photosynthetic prokaryote, now that was the evolution of chloroplasts, they believe. And there's a lot of evidence for it. As is said here, we went over this evidence in an earlier quarter, but we'll talk about it again. They both mitochondria and chloroplasts replicate independently, kind of like modern day prokaryotes. They contain their own DNA, just like modern day prokaryotes. Um, they're found in a circular arrangement, just like prokaryotes. All right. Um, so the, there's similarities, and that is how they believe eukaryotes form. So eukaryotes, they believe, were prokaryotes that started swallowing up smaller prokaryotes, and over time, the eukaryotic cells evolved as a result. We will stop there.